Members, it is now time for question time. Question time is to the Executive Office, and we will start with listed questions. Before I call Ms Sinead Bradley, I have to inform the House that question number four has been withdrawn. Ms Bradley. Thank you. Question one, please, Mr Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker. It is essential for the Executive to be able to conduct its work in an environment where Ministers can engage in full and frank discussion and be confident that the content of their papers and their views are protected. Uh, we do not therefore routinely uh, release information, including minutes of meetings which uh, provide details of executive business or its decision-making processes. The executive may, however, where it considers it appropriate, make a statement on its decisions or views on a particular issue. We therefore have uh, no plans to depart from this practice. Well, Mrs Bradley for a supplement. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, for your reply. Can you explain to me why the two parties represented, represented by FM and EFM at last week's business committee did an about turn on a fully crafted and agreed position of all five parties in March 2016 on the provisions for opposition debate on the floor of the Assembly? Did this about turn perhaps happen Can after two the opposition to come debates? To your question? Well, I, I think the uh, the question really specifically refers to the decisions uh, and, and minutes of uh, meetings of the executive. And uh, during the course of the uh, conversations that we have, we always think it valuable that ministers have the ability to engage in uh, discussions to enable uh, outcomes which uh, uh, make sure that we are in a position to provide uh, better government as we move forward. In terms of the work of the business community, uh, the, the business uh, committee, uh, obviously that's uh, the responsibility of the business committee. But I think that it's been made uh, abundantly clear that we regard the position that we have adopted uh, in the conduct of our business and how we relate to the assembly as being uh, appropriately uh, suited to the outcome from the Fresh Start Agreement. Call Mr. Mike Nett. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the, the Minister for, uh, for, for those remarks. Does he accept that uh, a lack of transparency, perhaps mixed with um, uh, not a very timely disclosure of ministerial information, often leaves senior civil servants in an impossible position, uh, not least when they try to come and brief statutory committees? Well, it's, it's, always, it's, it's always our uh, commitment to ensure that whenever uh, civil servants are uh, attending committees that they are in a position to provide as full of information as they, they possibly can. Uh, I think also that you know, it doesn't take me to remind people that during the course of the uh, last mandate uh, we did have a situation where we had a, a five-party coalition and uh, whenever people talk about transparency there were many meetings of the executive that took place where at least two of the parties had no difficulty whatsoever in stepping outside of the protocols and briefing uh, the media on the confidential business of the executive. Well, Mr. David Ford. I am quite sure the Deputy First Minister was not referring to either Stephen Farry or myself in his last comment. Given uh, what he's just said about the releasing of information from the executive, the complexity of the work to be done around the programme for government framework, the subsequent development of the programme for government, particularly where it relates to cross-departmental issues, could the Deputy First Minister inform us how members of the House and its committees will be informed of that process? Well, I, I, I want to thank the, the member for the support that he and his party gave to the approach that we've adopted uh, during the course of the uh, programme for government. Uh, it is uh, absolutely clear that that work which began way last year uh, was supported the whole way through by the Alliance Party. And uh, the Alliance Party, even though they decided not to come into the, the government on this occasion, uh, even in the aftermath of that decision, stood by their commitment to uh, process uh, a programme for government uh, draft which uh, had at its heart the uh, responsibility to engage with the community, with society and with key stakeholders. And I, and I appreciate that contribution. I think as we go forward in terms of the processing of the work of the programme for government, we take into account the point that the member has just made. I think it is 
vitally important as we go forward that we share as much information as is feasible. Call Mr. Colin McGrath. Uh, number two, Mr. Speaker. In uh, determining the roles and priorities of the Executive Office over the course of this mandate, we will be looking to the contribution we can make to the high-level outcomes contained in the Executive's programme for government. A draft framework uh, for the programme was agreed by the Executive on the 26th of May 2016 and was published the following day for public consultation. It contains 14 strategic outcomes which, taken together, the Executive believes articulate the society we wish to have. These outcomes are supported by 42 indicators, which are clear statements for change. A key feature of the new programme will be its dependence on collaborative working, and we will therefore be working as part of the executive team to deliver this. Uh, to deliver the programme and to drive work across both departmental and sectoral boundaries. During the period of public consultation, we will continue to deliver against our statutory responsibilities and existing plans, undertaking important work in the areas of equality, human rights and social change, building a united community, strategic investment and regeneration, on our relationships with others, North, South and East, West, and with Europe, and in promoting our interests abroad. None of this work is going to stop, but we will be looking onto the new programme for government at ways to do things better, taking a more joined up approach with our stakeholders and partners, and to find ways that will deliver the greatest benefits. Mr McGrath for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, could the Minister maybe uh, explain that given the reduced responsibilities of his department uh, that they now have, does it still justify having two ministers, two de uh, junior ministers, a fleet of ministerial cars and the largest collections of special advisers that our government has? And are there any plans to reduce this burden on our taxpayers? Uh, the answer is yes, it does justify it. Call Mr. Danny Kennedy. Mr. Uh, Speaker, given that when originally looking at a at, at, at reduction of departments, the idea had been uh, for the Executive Office to move to a coordinating role uh, rather than one of service delivery, can I ask the Minister what changed? Well, I, I think that we uh, still regard the coordinating role as being very important, but I think that. Uh, given the fact that we are now in a, a two-party uh, coalition, uh, it is uh, a, a huge responsibility, uh, and it's a responsibility that both ourselves and the DEP have uh, taken up against the backdrop of others uh, opting out uh, to, to ensure that we uh, continue to give leadership, and that falls primarily to the First Minister and myself, to ensure that the work of all of our departments are coordinated in a way that ensures uh, delivery. Uh, and of course, our responsibilities uh, are greater than the work of what happens at the executive. There are, of course, other uh, responsibilities that we do have uh, in uh, meeting with delegations and people who come here on an ongoing basis. So the whole business of uh, the work of government uh, basically now falls in terms of the leadership of taking that government forward to the DUP in Sinn Féin and specifically to the First Minister and myself. Mr. Cattle Boylan. Can the Minister confirm whether or not other parties had an opportunity in developing the draft framework and was there any objection to that in principle? Well, we, we've been over this quite a number of times over the course of recent weeks and it is on the public record that uh, the DUP, Sinn Féin and the Alliance Party uh, stood by the commitments that we made to put in place a programme for government that had the widest possible consultation and involving uh, key sectors within society and within the community who wish to contribute. This was a different approach and it was an approach that has worked successfully in some of the states in the United States, in, uh, in, in Scotland and uh, in Finland. So I think that from our perspective we believe that this represented the best way forward. This was also supported by key people uh, within the stakeholder section who came out very publicly and said that they agreed with this approach, that this was an opportunity for them to have the greatest possible input into the programme for government. And uh, it's, it's, it's vital that we continue to process that in a way that gives us the best possible outcomes 
and one in which society can be satisfied that they had their opportunity to have their say. Uh, the fact that uh, other parties uh, stood back from that and disavowed the uh, commitments that they made uh, at the very beginning. Well, specifically one other party, I should say, uh, in terms of the SDLP. It's, it's really a matter for the SDLP. Uh, the SDLP were fully engaged in the, the process from the very beginning, and it was only until the aftermath of the election, not before the election. At no stage before the election did they voice any disagreement with the approach that was being adopted. It was only in the aftermath of the election that they disagreed with the process, and I believe that was specifically down to their election results. Mr. Stewart, Dixon. Um, Deputy First Minister, can, can you assure the House, in the, in the light of the recent United Nations report, which highly criticised the segregated nature of our education system, that integrated education will receive the highest uh, priority when it comes to considering a uh, together building a united community? Well, I, as well as many other members of this House, absolutely value the contribution that integrated education makes. Uh, and I think there are, of course, many other sectors who make a, an incredible contribution to uh, an education system that has seen dramatic improvements in the, cor in the course of recent years with increasing numbers of young people emerging from uh, school with uh, five or more uh, GCSEs. Uh, I think the United Nations report over the course of the weekend is a very, very important report and should be studied by every single member <coughs> of this House. Well, Mr. Steve Aiken. Uh, an exit from the European Union is not a certainty. It will only be negotiated if the public vote to leave in the referendum on the 23rd of June. Uh, the British government has, has indicated that it is not planning on this basis, and we will also await the outcome of the uh, June referendum. Mr. Aiken, first supplementary. Supplementary. Uh, to ask the Deputy First Minister, in view of the concerns raised by the Northern Ireland business community, Northern Ireland business organisations and many of the political parties in this assembly, including his own party, whether he would be in discussion with his other government to party about looking closely at what the implications of a Brexit vote may be and what support a Brexit vote may raise, and then to formally take the opinion and the view of this chamber and then on behalf of all of the government representing that view to the people of Northern Ireland. Well, I think by this stage the, the views of all, all of the parties in the Assembly uh, are well known and uh, th there is no uh, difficulty, I think, in the, our partners in government understanding our position in relation to the, the referendum. We, we are very firmly in the Remain camp for all of the reasons that, you have, that the member has articulated. Uh, obviously, uh, our partners in government have a different view. Uh, this is a democracy. People are entitled to their view, but I very strongly hold to the view that uh, any decision to uh, leave the European Union would be hugely detrimental to uh, our society, to our business community, to our farming community, to the community and voluntary sector. Uh, and, and I also uh, note that uh, you know, people say there will be no borders uh, in, in the event, no checkpoints on the borders in the event of a Brexit. And I saw on social media this morning somebody put up a photograph of the border that exists between uh, Norway and the European Union. So uh, do I want to see checkpoints on the road from Derry to Larry Kenny, uh, on, the road on the road from Tyrone to uh, De Monaghan, from Uri to Dundalk? Certainly not. Ms. Clare. Much, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, interesting that the DFM noted that he would wait to see the outcome of the election before setting a hard course. Good idea. Pretty nobody else is allowed to do that. Um, in the disastrous event uh, of a Brexit, which powers currently with the European Union would he see being devolved to Northern Ireland? Has he done an audit of those powers, and which would usefully come to this assembly? Well, I think that you know people are jumping uh, the position in regard to the referendum. Uh, the referendum has not yet been held. It will be held on the 23rd. Uh, I don't know what the outcome will be. I hope it is a vote to remain. I think in the context of uh, the debate that has been had thus far, there are so many unknowns about what will happen on the other side of the referendum. Uh, and we will have to deal with whatever they are. 
And of course, there is, a, a, if unfortunately we end up in that scenario, there's a, a two-year uh, position in regard to negotiating uh, a way forward. Uh, and I presume there will be a lot of negotiations during the course of that period. But I'm not working on the basis of uh, this being uh, a Brexit vote. I, I'm working on the basis of it being a Remain vote. Well, Declan McAleer. Well, the Minister obviously agrees then that any exit would have a massive impact uh, here in the north of Ireland, given our particular circumstances. Well, well I think we, we all understand that uh, any such vote would have a, a massive impact. Uh, we, we've had the debate, uh, obviously in terms of the overall number of people who are entitled to vote, well, we represent only a very small percentage of those people who will vote, but I think we, we, we can say without fear of contradiction that uh, at, at the moment, given the support that there is from uh, the SDLP, the Alliance Party, the Ulster Unionists and ourselves, uh, the hope is that, that the, the majority of people in the North will vote to remain, and uh, if so, we'll, we will stand proudly with Scotland, who I believe also will stand uh, uh, on a position of remain. But the big votes in England, as, as many of us know, it's not a situation over which we have any control. Uh, I, I will be in England uh, later this week and, and making a speech outlining the implications of all of this for ourselves uh, and hoping the people there, uh, particularly the Irish community in, in Britain, will, uh, will, will recognise the, the great dangers for, uh, for us in terms of our economy and in terms of social interaction, north and south. <coughs> Well, Mr. Stephen, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Deputy First Minister mentioned the, the, the possibility uh, of, of border checks. Um, does he agree with me that the Leave campaign can't have it both ways? They argue on the one hand that they're going to control the borders and reduce immigration, and on the other, say we, weren't, we won't have a border um, checkpoint. Um, does he agree with me we should protect the free movement of people and that the Remain campaign should be honest, that if they want to control the borders, that means checkpoint? Or sorry, the Leave campaign should be honest. If they want to uh, control the borders, that does mean checkpoint. Well, I, I listened to Nigel Lawson's interview on the Andrew Marr show a couple of weeks ago, and he gave the game away very, very clearly. He was very emphatic that he believed that there would have to be checkpoints. Uh, and I think the fact is that we have now seen this morning uh, the photographs of checkpoints that exist between Norway and the rest of the European Union adds validity to the uh, argument that he made. He hasn't been the only person that said that. Uh, and I think it has to be a source of great concern uh, to all of us who, who I think have all benefited from uh, the open border position. I mean, we've, you can now drive from central Belfast to central Dublin in an hour and a half or an hour and three quarters without having a red light or a checkpoint. Uh, and I think the last thing that people here want to see, particularly the business community and those people who are socialising on a regular occasion, uh, and that's happening increasingly as the peace process develops, the last thing people want to see is anything which in any way interferes with the uh, very important social interaction uh, which takes place uh, north and south, or indeed east-west. Well, the people of the United Kingdom have the wisdom to unshackle us from the disastrous EU. Is there an assurance that the uh, Deputy First Minister and his party will not seek to stymie the opportunities to liberate business, including farming, from the costly regulation, will not stand in the way of the resulting bonfire of regulation, and will not stand in the way of the rebirth of our fishing industry? Well. Uh I think I represent a very responsible uh, political party within this assembly. Uh, the member may not think so, but I certainly think so. And I think in the aftermath of this vote, whatever the outcome of the vote, uh, we will behave very responsibly indeed. I, I think that it's hugely important that we all uh, recognize the, the seriousness of what is about to happen. The member takes a different view from myself, but again, he's entitled to uh, that uh, opinion. Uh, but Whatever happens on the other side of the vote, uh, we behave responsibly. We'll deal with our partners in government and with other parties in this House to ensure that we continue to move our society forward. Well, Ms. Naomi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I 
I, like the Deputy First Minister, also hope that the vote will be to remain. However, with respect to contingency, has the Deputy First Minister or indeed the First Minister received any assurance from the UK Government um, that the money which we currently receive from the EU into Northern Ireland would be replaced um, by Westminster uh, were, that, were we to go through the process of withdrawing from the EU? Well, the answer to that is no, that neither the First Minister or I have received any assurance uh, whatsoever. And uh, even if we had, I wouldn't trust it for one minute. This is a, a British government that uh, has been ruthless in its uh, dealing with our block grant over the course of the period that they were in coalition with the Liberal Democrats. And I have absolutely no faith whatsoever that whatever money is lost through single farm payments or cap or anything else uh, will be uh, returned to us uh, by a British government that is totally and absolutely committed to austerity. Well, Mr. Edwin, the Deputy First Minister recognise that uh, moving the uh, United Kingdom from Europe would bring much more powers back to this House, to this Assembly, and instead of having unelected commissioners making decisions which impact upon the lives of the people, that this Assembly uh, would be making those decisions and actually bring about a far greater level of democracy for the people of Northern Ireland? Well, my, my position is one of, uh, the same as my party, of critical engagement with the European Union. Uh, not everything about the European Union is hunky-dory, and we have articulated our concerns around different aspects, some of which he has referred to in the context of his uh, uh, remarks. Uh, but I think that what we have to deal with is the impact of a Brexit vote on how we develop our economy. And of course, as a member will know, over the course of my dealings with the uh, Reverend Ian Paisley, God rest him, and uh, Peter Robinson, and with Arlene Foster as Derry Minister, uh, and again now as First Minister, our visits to the United States have been hugely important in attracting more foreign direct investment jobs than at any other time in the history of the state. But all of the delegations and the access that we had, courtesy of uh, the then Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, to the highest levels of the business community in the United States, the issue of our involvement, continued involvement in Europe always come up. So I think one of the big difficulties that we face is, in the context of any Brexit vote, uh, how will that then impact on our ability to attract foreign direct investment, given that one of the major arguments that we used was that we were a near shore <laughs> location for a jump off into the European Union. So there are huge implications for us in this vote, and uh, I hope that uh, in the aftermath of the vote, the wisdom of the people will, uh, will, will come through and that they will recognise that the great benefits, particularly for ourselves, are ones that, that we should not spurn. Well, Mr. Roy Baird. Number five. Uh, Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I will ask Junior Minister uh, Ferrand to answer this question. As of the 1st of June 2016, the total number of staff employed by the Executive Office was 284. Well, Mr. Beggs, for supplementary. Each of the nine departmental ministers have a special advisor, and many of the direct functions which were in OFM DFM have now transferred out. So, given that transfer is function, how can the First Minister and Deputy First Minister continue to justify the increase in special advisors which they instigated? And will there be a reduction below the original uh, six, uh, uh, which was, was originally there, given the reduction in the function? I will thank the member for his question. Um, there are currently no plans to reduce the numbers of special advisors within the department. And I take the member's point, but although that the Executive Office is now more streamlined following the restructuring of departments, the Executive Office still covers a wide range of functions, and the work of ministers still has not reduced within that office. And much of our work also facilitates the, the business of the Executive of other ministers and their departments. We remain to be a key strategic driver across the Executive, um, and that requires a lot of detailed work. The, this, this department also continues to have responsibility for issues of significant political and cross-community interest, as well as a number of key priority areas for the executive. Um, but I do have to say that structures and staffing levels within the department are regularly reviewed um, to ensure that work is delivered in the most efficient and effective way possible. Well, Mr. Oliver McLaughlin. 
What has been the reduction in staff numbers and savings from the Executive Office arriving out of the voluntary exit scheme? Thank the member for his question. The voluntary exit scheme resulted in a reduction of eight posts within the legacy department OFMDFM. The last person exited, exited in tranche four at the end of March in this year, so all reductions were achieved prior to the formation of the Executive Office. In the year, pay bill savings realised as a result of the voluntary exit scheme amounted to £104,000, with ongoing anticipated annual savings of £336,000. Speaker, I find it somewhat interesting that our Deputy First Minister does not trust the Tories when it comes to Europe, but left our most vulnerable in his hands when it came to welfare reform. Sure, can, yeah, I ask, sure. um, can I ask the junior minister, um, in light of the number of uh, functions that have transferred out of, of the office, can she detail, please, the savings to the public purse in the expected number of, or sorry, in the reduction in the number of staff? I uh, thank the member for the question. I do not have the budgetary um, details with me at the minute, but I'm more than happy to write to the member. I will say, however, uh, within the transfer of functions to other departments after the restructuring of departments, that 56 posts went from OFM to to other departments. But I'm happy to come back to her with figures. Call Mr. Stephen Agnew. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number six. As the member will be aware, we have recently issued for consultation a draft programme for government framework, which sets the direction for the executive for the next five years. Uh, by the end of this year, we intend to have detailed plans in place for delivering our intended outcomes. It is therefore essential that the Executive's legislative proposals for this mandate should both reflect and support the priorities in the programme for government and therefore be developed in tandem with this process. Uh, while we acknowledge fully the need to advise the Assembly of our legislative proposals, this cannot be done in isolation from the wider development of the programme for government. And we will be given further consideration to the timing and most appropriate means of providing this information. Sir Agnew, for a supplement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Deputy First Minister for his, his answer. A, a lot of work has going into looking at how we can make this assembly operate better. And I think there was um, members in the House were only too well aware of the, the, the flurry of legislation that came towards the end of the last mandate, meaning some very complex bills maybe didn't get the time and the attention they deserve. So uh, what guarantee can the Deputy First Minister give that we will provide le produce legislation in a more managed, um, uh, strategic way rather than a, a, a rush at the end of the mandate? Well, I mean, in the previous mandate, 60 of the 64 executive bills which were introduced in the previous mandate were passed by the Assembly following a, a huge effort by members, ministers and committees, particularly in the period from January to March of this year. Uh, this was comparable with the 2007-2011 mandate when 65 executive bills were introduced. Uh, we hope that we can build on those experiences and take into account what the Member has just said to learn uh, whatever lessons need to be learned uh, to ensure a successful outcome for the executive's legislative programme in the uh, current mandate. Uh, and I think it's also interesting when you compare it with other legislators. While the remit of other legisl legislators differs from the Assembly, it is nevertheless interesting to note that compared to the 60 executive bills passed in the last mandate, the equivalent figure for Scotland was 67. And in Wales, the figure was 25. Michelle Gildernew. Um, of, uh, the Deputy First Minister has just answered my question in his last sentence. So, Gurmi Lamagov. Well, Mr. Alex Atwood. Speaker, uh, acknowledging both uh, the independence of the Hart inquiry, but acknowledging also that Judge Hart has said that he will recommend a. Uh, compensation or redress scheme for victims and survivors, and given the demand of that from so many victims and survivors, is it not now time for the Executive Office to, as a minimum, begin to scope out what a redress scheme should look like in advance and complementary to the forthcoming recommendation from the Hart Inquiry? Well, I, I think the, the member asks a, a, a very important question, and uh, we have been guided from the very get-go of this inquiry by uh, Sir Anthony Hart's stewardship of the process. He has certainly, during the course of the uh, inquiry, uh, made it clear that he, he does believe that there will be a need for a redress uh, system. We take that uh, very, very seriously indeed. 
Uh, and I have no doubt whatsoever that our thoughts are turning to how we can deal with that. But he also went on to say that he still had work to do. Uh, and of course, uh, in the aftermath of this, and without attempting in any way to preempt the outcome of it, uh, the responsibility for redress uh, may well fall to uh, other uh, parties than uh, the government here. So it, it's, uh, it's obviously something that uh, can only be decided by Judge Anthony Hart. He's in the final stages of his inquiry, as the member well knows at the moment, so hopefully we, we won't have too long to wait. Although I think, given what uh, victims of abuse have been through, uh, that's obviously not the answer that they are seeking at this time. But I hope that all of this can be processed uh, very, very thoroughly indeed, in line with uh, 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 Judge Hart's uh, handling of the situation. And I want to pay tribute to him for the incredible work that he has done on all our behalf over, co over the course of recent years. That ends the period for listed questions. We now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. I call Mrs Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. <clears throat> can I ask the Deputy First Minister if he can explain why the announcement of the paramilitary panel report wasn't made in this chamber? Well, I, I think that uh, obviously the, the announcement of the paramilitary panel report fell to the uh, First Minister uh, and myself. Uh, during the course of the uh, fresh start negotiations, it, it became uh, certainly quite clear to me that uh, in the aftermath of the election, uh, there was uh, a very strong uh, probability that we would find ourselves uh, in government uh, with the DUP, uh, effectively a two-party uh, coalition. Uh, we were the people who asked uh, and actually appointed the panel members, and I want to put on record our deep appreciation to John McBurney, to uh, Monica McWilliams, and to Lord Alderdice for the very thorough uh, work that they've done. Uh, we believe that it was important as soon as uh, it was feasible and practicable for us to uh, publish the, the report as quickly as we could. And, and I think that doesn't do injury to anybody's right within the Assembly to have a view on that report. It's a report which I think has been widely welcomed by people within society. And uh, I think that, you know, as, as we go forward, uh, obviously members have uh, a, a duty if they feel uh, that uh, they have a grievance about this to raise it in the Assembly. The important thing for me is the work that they were engaged in, the outcome of that work, and the key responsibility that we now have to put in place by the, uh, the end of this month uh, a process uh, which is about implementing it. And that primarily falls to the Democratic Unionist Party, uh, to ourselves and to the new Justice Minister. Parties like the Ulster Unionists and the SDLP uh, effectively stepped away from that responsibility. Mrs Dobson for a supplementary. Can I thank the Deputy First Minister for his, his answer, but perhaps in the future it would be better to make such announcements if, if they were definitely should be made in this House, however we are where we are with this one. Can he then provide the House with an update on the action plan following this report and when it's likely to be completed? Well, we have given a, a commitment at, at the uh, start of the Fresh Start Agreement announcement that we would keep to the time frames uh, that, that were uh, laid out for us. And the time frame for the putting forward the implementation plan arising from the work of the three-person panel, uh, that must be completed by the end of this month. Uh, so, presently as we speak, that work uh, is being undertaken, and I can give an absolute commitment that by the end of June uh, we will have kept to uh, the, the public commitment that we made. Oh, Ms. Joanne Bunting. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Deputy First Minister through you, what's his response to those who are saying that Sinn Féin uh, is not committed to the devolution of and reduction in corporation tax? Well, Sinn Féin is uh, committed to the reduction in corporation tax, and at the very beginning of this debate, the five larger parties in this assembly uh, were uh, absolutely in favour of such uh, a process on the basis that we did believe, and still do believe, 
that it can create anything in the region of between 35 and 37,000 new jobs. So, absolutely committed to that. But I think, as the Fresh Start Agreement makes clear, it has to be on the basis of affordability. But we believe that it can be on the basis of affordability. So, we are working on the basis that the uh, reduced rate of corporation tax uh, will come into being uh, by 2018. Ms Bunting for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In the light of the Deputy First Minister's answer, would he confirm that he and his party are taking and will continue to take all opportunities to sell the future prospects in Northern Ireland after corporation tax has been reduced? Well, I, I think I've got a very strong track record in uh, selling uh, the need for jobs and uh, our proposition to particularly US investors, but also in places like China, uh, and uh, in the European Union. Uh, the reality is that over the course of what was the worst world economic downturn that we've ever seen, uh, the work that I was engaged in with my colleagues in government, principally from uh, the DUP, uh, Ian Paisley, Peter Robinson, Arlene Foster, brought in more foreign direct investment jobs than at any other time in the history of the state. So I am absolutely committed and dedicated to providing more jobs particularly for young people. And I think in all of our engagements in the United States, there was intense interest in uh, us reducing the, the rate of corporation tax, which is a further incentive for foreign direct investors to come. Uh, obviously, I, I don't know what view those investors will take in the context of the run into uh, this referendum. I think they're all sitting waiting to see what the decision of uh, the people here and in England, Scotland and Wales would be in relation to uh, Brexit. Uh, so I, I don't know what their view will be on the other side of that. That amounts to another one of these unknowns, but uh, and absolutely in principle, uh, my view is that we need to have all of the tools that we possibly can have to ensure that we are continuing to show that we're open for business and that we are attracting uh, new jobs for people who need them. Well, Mr. Steve Hagan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, could I ask the Deputy First Minister to join the Assembly in condemning horrific attacks on Orlando and to agree with the Assembly that violence has no part to play in forwarding any political agenda? Well, I, I unreservedly condemn the terrible massacre uh, that took place uh, against innocent people in Orlando. It, it was a horrific crime. Uh, and it again raises this whole issue, which is to the fore in the United States of America, about the ability of people to access weapons uh, by just walking into a shop and purchasing them. And it seems that this character, who, who was responsible for the massacre, uh, and, and in effect did that over the course of the last couple of weeks. Uh, thankfully, we here in, in the North, and I'm uh, obviously reading into the question uh, whether or not the uh, attitude of my party, for example, in, in the context of all that we have been through over the course of uh, uh, 40 or 50 years, and more importantly, over what has been a very important peace process that has transformed both the security and the political situation, are, are committed to totally peaceful and democratic means. Absolutely, totally committed to totally peaceful uh, and democratic means, to, to the point where those who are not in favour of peaceful and democratic means have threatened our lives have attacked our homes. So I think my track record, just as it is good in relation to attracting jobs and standing up to so-called dissident Republicans, extreme loyalists who try to foment conflict on the streets, I think my sec track record is second to none. Do we for supplementary? Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. And can I thank the Deputy First Minister for his views on Orlando? And I would also like him to outline what he and his department are planning to do to remove the scourge of paramilitarism from, and political violence from Northern Ireland. Well, again, on Orlando, the First Minister and myself will go tomorrow to uh, Belfast City Hall, where we will jointly sign the uh, Book of Condolence. And I think that sends a very uh, strong message. We've already uh, <coughs> issued a, a statement uh, about this. Uh, as well as uh, obviously remembering uh, a young man, uh, Darren Rogers, who lost his life in an accident in France overnight. We're all absolutely gutted at that. I think that from our perspective as, as we go forward, 
the three-person panel, I think, has done a, an incredible job on our behalf. Uh, it's our task now to implement that, but it's also our task to continue to show that politics works, to show that we as politicians, coming from different ideological backgrounds, different allegiances, have the ability against the agreements that we've made between us over the course of the last 20 years to continue to take our society forward. And that has essentially meant for all of us uh, compromises that had to be made. And I am proud of the compromises that I have been part of. And I hope everybody else in this House attached to all our political parties are proud of the compromises that they've made. That is the only hope for going forward in our society. And it is one that I believe is overwhelmingly supported by those who support the peace process. Well, Mr. Sidney Anders. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Is the Deputy First Minister confident that uh, the reduced number of departments on the back of the Fresh Start Agreement will have delivery as a focus? Yes, I, I think that there's been a very wide welcome for the reduction in the number of departments from 12 to 9. Uh, and I suppose you know, one of the key decisions that were made uh, in the context of, of that uh, exercise was the amalgamation of the Department of Employment and Learning and uh, the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Investment and the new Department of the Economy. Uh, that is absolutely vital for us as we try to continue to develop our economy, particularly in relation to uh, hopefully the, the new jobs that we believe that we can attract, but the huge responsibility that we have to ensure that we have the uh, people who are uh, educated uh, in the proper skills to ensure that we have the ability to attract uh, those jobs. So the big challenge for us going forward is to ensure that uh, we, we support further and higher education, uh, and that will require a commitment. Uh, I have no doubt that that will be a big feature of the consultation process that we will be through over the course of the next uh, seven weeks. But that, that amalgamation of those two departments represents an enormous change. Uh, it's one that we've all signed up to, and it's one that we believe will uh, produce economic dividends for our people. Well, Mr. Anderson, for supplement. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Deputy First Minister for that response and, uh, and, and the answers he has given me. Uh, but I think we, we would all agree that whatever happens, it is certainly essential that delivery will be at the forefront as we move forward over the next mandate. Would, you, would the Deputy First Minister agree with that? I, I would absolutely agree. I think delivery is of critical importance, and I think the uh, ministers that uh, are around the executive table from both the DUP and Sinn Féin, who uh, <laughs> are absolutely committed to ensuring that uh, we do deliver, uh, are full of uh, enthusiasm and determination to ensure that we all work collectively together. Just last week, the First Minister and myself went to the, uh, to, to the uh, new committee of the Executive Office, uh, and we both made it clear that we don't believe that departments working in silos uh, is of any benefit whatsoever to us. What we need to see is a cohesive, joined-up approach with departments uh, delivering on, on the basis of uh, working through each other, examining what more can be done, and ensuring that, as they do that, that we are in a position to bring forward the uh, processes and strategies which will be of benefit to the people that all of us represent. Call Ms. Linda Dillon. Can I ask the Deputy First Minister to outline the benefits of the draft programme for government for the young people of my constituency of Mid Ulster? Well, I, I would hope that uh, people in Mid Ulster, and it was a, a constituency that I was very proud to represent over many years, uh, now obviously moved to the FOIL constituency. But I hope that people there uh, will engage in the consultation, just like people in every other constituency of the 18 constituencies uh, in the north, to ensure that we get the, the widest possible buy-in. And of course, there has to be a big focus on young people, on things like education, on health, and indeed on uh, our ability to attract jobs which will put those young people into gainful employment. So, you know, we could talk about the individual circumstances of an individual constituency, but I don't want to pass up the opportunity of sending a very clear message to each of the 18 constituencies out there that the next seven weeks provides a, a golden opportunity for stakeholders, for society in general, to engage in a process uh, that gives them the maximum uh, possible buy-in uh, around issues that affect them, and not least the whole issue of our young people 
our, our education system, our health service, our ability to attract jobs, our ability to ensure that, uh, that we lead uh, communities that are not full of despair but full of hope. Still on first supplementary. Thank you. And could I ask the Deputy First Minister then to give us reassurance that the final draft will prioritise early intervention so as to give our young, vulnerable people the best start in life? Remind the Minister is a minute for a reply. Well, I, I think that the point made is, is a, a very valid point. It is hugely important that all of the departments who have a responsibility uh, recognise that uh, prevention is better than cure. Ms. Carla Lockhart for a quick one. You may not get a supplementary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And can I ask through you around delivering social change, which was obviously announced in 2012? Can the Deputy First Minister inform this House uh, whether or not all of the central funding commitments in respect of this programme have been met? Well, uh, de delivering social change was a hugely successful. Uh, process that we were involved in around a range of issues and it was set up by the executive to tackle poverty and social uh, exclusion. Uh, central funding for the six uh, initial signature programmes which were designed to tackle poverty, improve children's health, well-being, educational and life opportunities completed in March uh, 2016. Of course there are three further programmes jointly funded by Atlantic uh, Philanthropies. So all of this uh, I think has been an enormous success and up until March of this year have been fully funded. Time is up. 